Good morning, and welcome to today's meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California. I'm Dr. Karen Philbrick, and I'm the Executive Director of the Mineta Transportation Institute at San Jose State University and the chair for your program today. Today, we are very pleased to present the 11th annual Norman Y. Mineta Policy Summit, a partnership with the Commonwealth Club of California. In the Bay Area, the Commonwealth Club has suspended all in-person programming and instead has adopted a virtual format. Please, you can learn more about these club offerings at their website, commonwealthclub.org. And please be sure to share and like today's program on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Today's program is entitled, Paying for Transportation in California. Does COVID-19 change everything? As we all know, the COVID-19 pandemic threatens every impact excuse me, every aspect of transportation funding in California and revenue from federal, state, and local taxes and fees are all at risk. The state has already faced plummeting revenues from gasoline taxes, tolls, transit fares, and sales taxes. So our speakers today will address what to do next. Can we rely on our traditional mix of revenue sources? Or does this present an opportunity to stimulate innovation in transportation finance. Today's program consists of two parts. In the beginning, we welcome the Honorable David Kim, Secretary of the California State Transportation Agency, who will give the keynote, followed by a few questions. Then a distinguished panel will gather and we'll talk about opportunities for every level of government to help recover transportation revenues during our uncertain future. For a full bio of today's speakers, please see the virtual program. A link was transmitted to you today by the Commonwealth Club when the link for this program was sent. Now, before I make uh, an introduction of our wonderful moderator, I'd like to acknowledge the MTI trustees that are with us today specifically our founder, the Honorable Secretary Norman Y. Mineta, our board chair, Abbas Mahadis, our vice chair, Will Kempton, and the many, many other trustees who have made time to join us today. Thank you. It's now my pleasure to introduce today's moderator for both the keynote portion and the panel, Ms. Nuria Fernandez. She is the chair of the American Public Transportation Association, she is the general manager and CEO of the Santa Clara Valley Transportation Authority. She is past chair of the Mineta Transportation Institute, and she's a phenomenal human being, a wonderful mentor and friend to many. Ms. Fernandez has dedicated over 35 years of her life to the transportation industry, and she's currently responsible for over 2,100 employees who are delivering projects, programs, and transit services for the more than 2 million people in Silicon Valley. She has many, many successes to her credit, but among the highlights of her tenure at VTA is the construction of the $7 billion extension of the Bay Area Rapid Transit into Silicon Valley. She's previously served in multiple other high-profile transportation leadership positions, including Acting Federal Transit Administrator under President Bill Clinton. Welcome, Nuria, and please take it away. And now, allow me to introduce our keynote speaker, Secretary David Kim. Uh, Secretary Kim was appointed by Governor Gavin Newsom in 2019. I believe he'll be reaching his first year anniversary this week or later next week. Uh, he is the third Secretary of the California State Transportation Agency. His role, Secretary Kim, is responsible for oversight of 40,000 employees across eight departments, boards, and commissions, whose mission is to advance a safe, environmentally sustainable transportation system that maximizes mobility for all Californians. A longtime transportation leader, Secretary Kim, uh, comes from the private sector as well as all three levels of government. He has served as the Vice President of Government Affairs for Hyundai Motor Company from 2017 to 2019. He also spent nearly eight years in senior level roles at the U.S. Department of Transportation. Welcome, Secretary Kim. 
Well, thank you very much, Nuria, for the kind introduction and good morning, everybody. Greetings from Sacramento. Now, before I left DC to move to Sacramento to take on this role about a year ago, I promised Norm I would get to know the Mineta Transportation Institute at San Jose State University. And thankfully that has happened. I've had the great honor of interacting with Executive Director Karen Philbrick, and I've also gotten acquainted with several members of the faculty, including Professor Asha Weinstein Agarwal and Professor Leonard Lira, who invited me to speak to one of his classes not too long ago, another Zoom meeting, and it was really a lot of fun to interact with his uh, graduate level students. I'm also happy to tell you that my colleagues and I at CalSTA have made good use of the excellent research products and issue briefs, briefs produced by the Manana Transportation Institute. And we're grateful for the Institute's outstanding research and education programs, which are really driving thoughtful change in a transportation arena that is evolving ever so rapidly. Also a quick shout out to the Commonwealth Club of California for hosting today's event. They are a long standing institution when it comes to providing an important forum for insightful conversations on local, state, national, and international issues of significance. So a big thanks to the Commonwealth Club for uh, their role with today's event. Well, all of us are here today to address an important and timely topic, the risks to transportation revenues throughout all levels of government brought on by the COVID-19 pandemic. And also to discuss opportunities to recover revenues through innovation in transportation finance. So to that end, I'm gonna talk about three things. One, the current status of our state's transportation budget. Two, the federal stimulus and our current efforts on surface transportation reauthorization. And three, our opportunity in the midst of crisis for a transformative recovery. The question is, how can we best meet the current moment to provide for the transportation needs of Californians while also leveraging short-term momentum into long-term changes? But before I get into the specifics of our financial situation, I'd like to briefly highlight the challenges transit agencies, agencies have been facing and the work we've been doing alongside them since the start of the pandemic. Now, I would be remiss if we did not acknowledge that this week has been marked by a significant resurgence in new COVID-19 cases and that the COVID-19 crisis has had a dramatic impact on public transportation. Several of our panelists this morning work in public transportation and as someone who once did a stint with a transit agency, LA Metro, I'm also passionate about public transportation. Clearly, these are tough times for public transportation here in California and everywhere else in the world. It's often said that leaders are measured against the severity of the challenges they face, and Governor Newsom frequently talks about meeting the moment. That's one of his favorite phrases. And in this new age of COVID-19, workers in the transportation sector are meeting this moment every day and I want to acknowledge them. Transit workers in particular have been at the forefront of our tragic and heroic national narrative. We've all seen Detroit bus driver Jason Hargrove's Facebook Live video, decrying a passenger who wouldn't cover a cough and then warning all of us to take the virus seriously. Jason posted the video in late March and then tragically died a few weeks later from COVID-19. We've also read about the tragedies in New York City where more than 130 MTA workers died from the virus. And there have been several thoughtful articles about the future of transportation because many people are passionate about this topic. We all know that transit agencies are facing financial distress as their revenue sources, sales taxes, payroll taxes, and fares are impacted by the pandemic. We've seen transit ridership decline by staggering levels and transit agencies have experienced or are experiencing staffing shortages as workers become ill or caring for someone who is ill or taking leave for fear or be, of becoming ill. But while a lot of things are changing quickly for public transportation, their critical role and fundamental importance in our communities will not change. Transit is an essential service that, especially at this time, serves employees who've also been deemed essential. Now, those of us who don't have to commute to work during this emergency because we're teleworking should realize that we're relying on those who do to staff our grocery stores, provide health care, maintain basic city services, and keep the supply chain moving. And these essential workers are relying on public transportation. And so if you think about it this way, everyone is relying on transit to keep our economy and our society moving. So as we work through this crisis together, 
Government leaders and policymakers need to realize that transit isn't a business. Transit agencies don't exist to make profits, they exist to provide essential services. Soon after the state of emergency was declared by the governor, CalSTA convened standing conference calls with our industry partners to find out firsthand how the virus was affecting transit, transit and transportation operations throughout the state. Our highest priority was keeping the supply chain open and keeping essential goods and workers moving. And as a result of these discussions, CalSTA and our departments have worked hand in hand with transit stakeholders to take swift action in response to COVID-19. For example, Caltrans expended or expedited distribution of CARES Act fund to funding to small and rural transit agencies, getting the first 30 million of Section 5311 funding dispersed faster than almost any other state. Also, the DMV extended motor carrier permits expiring in March, April, and May through June 30th. Expiring commercial driver's licenses are valid through September 30th, which is consistent with federal emergency action. We also worked with the governor's office to develop executive orders to provide a waiver for expiring medical certificates required for commercial driver's licenses. Additionally, our agency helped write guidance for transit and rail operators. It's a set of best practices when it comes to physical distancing and hand washing, use of face coverings by employees and passengers alike, cleaning and disinfecting vehicles and so forth. And just this past April, my agency awarded 500 million in transit and intercity rail capital program grants to 17 recipients, including quite a few here in the Bay Area. These grants will leverage more than 4.9 billion in additional investment. Now, although the current pandemic is putting tremendous stress on transit agencies, these funds from TIRCP will advance long-term capital projects that will help with economic recovery in the years ahead. We also worked closely with the California Transit Association and Cal Act to distribute 60,000 face masks to transit operators around the state. And let me say this on partnerships, while transit is facing extreme challenges tied to COVID-19, I personally see tremendous cooperation and coordination in the industry at both a statewide and regional level. And a great example is right here in the Bay Area. The Metropolitan Transportation Commission recently convened a Blue Ribbon, Blue Ribbon Task Force that I'm honored to serve on with civic leaders and elected officials like Senator Jim Bell, Assemblymember David Chu, Therese McMillan, head of MTC, and Commissioner Carl Guardino of the California Transportation Commission, among many others. The region is asking a very important question. How do we rebuild and reimagine transit as we begin to restore service to meet the needs of future riders? This is a critically important initiative, and I look forward to contributing to and learning from the task force as we explore solutions to enhance the future of, tra of transit. Now let's turn to the status of transportation funding. California faces a multi-year effort to address the current 54.3 billion state budget deficit. Thankfully, we entered this crisis from a strong economic position, particularly for transportation funding. While all budgets will be impacted by this crisis, the transportation budget remains about the same as in January. SB1 funds continue to be collected, and while they're down, the projection is that 5.5 billion will be generated in the budget year. And on the stability of transportation funding, let me be clear, no SB1 or Article 19 revenues are being used to address the general fund shortfall. In addition to the substantial drop in general fund revenues, the forecast for fuel tax revenues, which is slightly different from SB1, has dropped by 578 million in the current year and by another 670 million in the budget year. And so, Altogether, fuel tax revenues are expected to drop by a total of 1.8 billion over the next five years. I think we can all agree, all agree that SB1, when it passed in 2017, achieved what was once a pipe dream, a stable source of transportation funding in California. And transportation investment is clearly expected to be an important source of jobs as we recover. In the immediate term, Caltrans has, has accelerated projects, which in turn has created new jobs and also improved the condition of our state highway system. We also intend to maintain current staffing levels for engineering and planning positions so that we can continue developing and designing previously programmed projects. And this is gonna help maintain our state of readiness when federal stimulus funds become available. And here's some good news. 
As a state, we're in a stronger position than some to continue our progress. We currently have cash balances within, within the state highway account, more than 2.2 billion, the public transportation account, 1.4 billion, and the road maintenance and rehabilitation account, more than 2.1 billion at the end of the third quarter. In fact, through the third fiscal quarter, state highway account revenues were coming in 3% above forecast and road maintenance and rehabilitation account revenues were 4% above forecast. But having said that, the road to recovery is going to be long and to be honest, won't be easy. We're gonna to need to draw from some of the lessons learned from the great recession. And we have to begin thinking of creative ways to address the needs of California's transportation system and revenue sources moving forward. And just like the Great Recession of 10 years ago, the federal government will play a significant role in helping states recover from the effects of COVID-19. Federal stimulus funds will be critical to continue capital projects, create new jobs, and begin a road to economic recovery. The HEROES Act, which passed the House in May, provides 15 billion to state DOTs to mitigate the effects of the pandemic. California's share of this funding would be almost 1.4 billion. We're also supporting the request by AASHTO to increase HEROES Act funding for state DOTs to 50 billion, which would provide California almost 4.7 billion. And although projections on the reduction of gas tax revenue are thankfully not as dire as they've been in the past, we're not shying away from our duty in being forward thinking and deliberate about the longer term future of transportation funding in California. Meeting California's aggressive environmental targets in large part depend on all of us transitioning from internal combustion engines to electrified powertrains. But as we all know, tax revenue for road maintenance and repairs are dependent on gas taxes. And as fuel efficiency increases and alternative fuel vehicles become the norm, transportation funding will face a deficit. So to address this longer term revenue issue, we have a road charge program underway and we're being methodical and doing our due diligence to build this right from the bottom up. Caltrans, at my request, is completing a scan to determine research gaps that may still exist. A report will be finished by the end of this year to help identify next steps. And following a very successful pilot program that took place a few years ago, which involved 5,000 participants, Caltrans is leading a demonstration project to test various payment methods, including pay at the pump and usage-based insurance to make it easy on consumers. Let's turn our focus back to Washington. We're all hoping that Congress will provide robust relief funding for transportation. But this year, we also have an opportunity to test to set the trajectory for transformative long-term recovery as Congress reauthorizes federal service transportation programs. Before I became California's transportation secretary, I served as a senior transportation official in the Obama administration with Therese McMillan during the Great Recession, where I helped in implement the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009. The Recovery Act moved America from recession to transformative recovery through infrastructure investment, and it really demonstrated how crises can be a catalyst for positive change. In addition to increased federal funding for transportation, we need the right policies to make sure we're not just, not just bouncing back, but bouncing forward into economic recovery. Next week, the House will be voting on the Invest in America Act, which authorizes $494 billion over five years to make transformative investments in surface and rail transportation. CalSTA is supporting the, investment in, the Invest in America Act, not only because it increases funding for California, but also because it gets the policy right on greenhouse gas emissions, on social equity, and in many other areas. In the next five years, the Invest in America Act will provide California roughly $26.5 billion in federal aid highway program and portion funding. That's a 37% increase over the current surface transportation law, the FAST Act. The Invest in America Act is also substantially increases transit funding and is supported by the California Transit Association. And what I find really exciting is that the bill aligns well with many of our policy recommendations outlined in the California Federal Surface Transportation Reauthorization Principles, a document we put out last fall that was endorsed by over 30 industry associations and local and tribal government entities in California. 
For example, the Invest in America Act creates new funding programs to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, to deploy alternative fuel, fuel charging infrastructure, and make our infrastructure more resilient to climate change-induced natural disasters. It also increases funding for intercity passenger rail projects and assistance to transit agencies procuring zero emission buses. So the House is off to a great start in advancing a brand new reauthorization bill, and we're thrilled to see it moving forward. At the same time, a new transportation law from Washington DC is just one tool to start planning for transformative recovery. This crisis gives us an opportunity to pause and reflect on our current transportation system, break out of entrenched patterns, and potentially rebound and grow in a healthier, more sustainable direction. In my own view, the current pandemic makes abundant, abundantly clear, perhaps more than ever, the importance of active transportation and advancing transportation options and infrastructure that promote greater health, sustainability, and equity. Despite the fact that our communities have been transitioning in and out of lockdown, this can still be a dynamic period for urban design and renewal. There have been uh, quite a few thoughtful articles describing how pandemics have reshaped cities throughout history. For example, 19th century cholera pandemics, which were attributed to noxious air, spurred cities to make more green space for people. And that's what led to the creation of wider tree-lined boulevards, recreation grounds, and lush public parks, including Central Park in New York City. So today we have an opportunity to reimagine our cities, redesign street grids, build wider sidewalks and expand bike infrastructure, and potentially look at permanently converting certain streets to be car free. So for example, cities like Oakland and Los Angeles have closed portions of their streets to cars, and that allows more room for pedestrians and cyclists to travel while practicing physical distancing. And to expand on this point, let me quote from a New York Times opinion piece that was published just this week entitled, Take Back the Streets from the Automobile. Forward-looking cities, large and small, have already jumped into action. In Medlin, the innovative Colombian city nestled in the Andes, workers are seizing traffic lanes and slapping down yellow paint to signify a change. Cars have been evicted and the lanes are now reserved for bicyclists. In Kampala, the capital of Uganda, authorities have closed streets, encouraged cycling, and sped the construction of new bike lanes and walkways. In European cities, quote, corona cycleways have become the new norm. And so that's an excerpt. I think it's also important to consider how communities with fewer multimodal options, especially those with a greater share of lower income, minority and elderly populations can take advantage of the benefits provided by active transportation, especially now. And so let me close with this. As a nation, we are currently responding to a global pandemic, an economic recession and public outcry over institutionalized racism and police brutality. Yet amid this uncertainty, I am bolstered by the belief that opportunities to make lasting societal improvements often become possible during challenging times. And rightfully so, events of the past few weeks have raised our collective consciousness around issues of systemic racism, injustice, and social equity, and the role all of us can play as leaders in the public and private sector in correcting injustices that have disproportionately impacted Black communities and people of color for far too long. A couple weeks ago, I released a statement on racial equity, justice, and inclusion in transportation. And one of the things we say in that statement is that the California State Transportation Agency strongly condemns systemic racism and discrimination in all forms, including those historically entrenched in transportation. And we also point out that transportation decisions of the past literally put up barriers, divided communities, and amplified racial inequalities, especially in our black and brown communities. I very much believe that the principles of racial equity, inclusion and diversity are foundational to achieving our vision of a cleaner, safer, more accessible and more connected transportation future for California. And so going forward, CalSTA and our departments will be part of the solution. We're gonna promote policies and programs that, um, that reflect these principles. And we're gonna work with stakeholders to identify areas of improvement. Transportation systems are about people. We are gonna take steps to ensure that transportation systems are designed and delivered in a manner that will provide safe and equitable access to opportunity, especially for people of color and disadvantaged communities to truly enhance quality of life. 
Because in the end, for those of us who consider transportation to be our calling, that is what we're all about. That's why we're here. And so with that, thank you so much for allowing me to join you today. And I wish you all the best for a productive and successful summit. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Secretary Kim. That was an excellent uh, presentation. You covered everything from partnerships to funding to uh, current and historical events that frame the direction that we are in today. And then you also touched on the equity. So I, um, if you could indulge me, uh, I think we have a few minutes uh, for a couple questions. And I wanted to start talking about ridership. Uh, even before the pandemic, many of the transit agencies uh, in the state were experiencing a decline in ridership, uh, which is of grave concern. And now with the pandemic, we have seen uh, some staggering percentages, uh, and I'm sure you're familiar with them, all the way to 90% of loss in ridership. So. What is the state doing to help spur innovation that could potentially help us uh, increase ridership now so that we could have a better and stronger footing for the future? Thanks for the question, Nuria. Um, a couple things I'd like to say. Um, you're, you're absolutely right. Before the pandemic, ridership um, had been struggling. And there was a survey done by USC, and I think it came out in January or February, and they surveyed Angelinos and wanted to know why they were avoiding transit. And again, keep in mind, this is before the pandemic. Um, the vast majority of respondents uh, indicated that they are avoiding transit because of concern over their own personal safety. Uh, what will the other passenger do, passenger do on the bus or, or light rail? Is that person gonna lash out at me? Will they break out into a violent um, outburst? Um, and I think that's in reference to um, the fact that many individuals who take transit on are homeless individuals. and and uh, uh, those who were surveyed were concerned about um, how they would react and how they would behave on board. And so now we have the pandemic where ridership uh, plunged to record low levels. And um, I think it is incumbent upon all transit agencies to, uh, to demonstrate to the public that uh, people can get on board uh, without compromising their health or safety. And I think agencies are, are, are doing that. They're mindful of the fact that uh, it's it's going to require extra cleaning protocols um, and, and making sure that there is plenty of physical distancing available on a bus, light rail, or subway. So I think agencies like yours, Nuria, and others are doing a good job of um, addressing and identifying and laying out strategies. At the state level, uh, I'll mention that we have something called the California Integrated Travel Project called ICAL ITP, which is um, meant to be um, a, a seamless uh, payment platform that will enable anyone to use uh, Cal ITP, an electronic payment system, to ride seamlessly throughout the state of California. And it's not meant to replace the Clipper card in the Bay Area, but it's meant to uh, supplement. And this is the type of payment system and trip planning system that will uh, make it easier for customers um, and to uh, make transit more convenient um, in a more integrated uh, and seamless way. And so we're excited about that. We're, we're going through the process of, of, um, of um, making refinements and developing it and hope to be in a position in the next few years to roll it out. Yeah, and we're looking forward to continue working and partnering with you and your team on that very important project. Seamless uh, transportation and connectivity is one of the clarion calls of our riders. Uh, Let's start, shift now to funding. And you, you did a great job in laying out all of the different um, sources that uh, we in transportation depend on. So transit agencies in California rely on a variety of uh, sources to support the, the capital funding and operations. So how have these uh, funding revenues uh, been impacted by COVID-19? And uh, what should we expect in terms of what we had projected versus what may actually happen and its effect on our ability to continue operating and providing this broad level of service? Yeah, that's a really important question. And um, as, as you know, there are a number of transit agencies, not just in the Bay Area, but, but other places around the country that uh, rely heavily on, on passenger fares to cover the vast majority of operating expenses, systems like Caltrain, BART, and, and then on the other hand, there are other systems that have a more diversified set of revenue sources. So everyone's in a different situation. Um, and so the, the challenge for all of us is to make sure that 
revenue sources, whether you rely on one or two or many more, um, can be stable. And that's going to be the challenge going forward. Um, as I mentioned in my remarks, we were fortunate to be in a position to, to award $500 million in TIRCP grants in April, uh, Transit and Intercity Rail Capital Program. And um, that's one of the, um, uh, the products of SB1. And we hope to be able to continue doing that going forward uh, because clearly um, capital investment will be a part of economic recovery uh, as we gradually uh, move forward. So I think that's a challenge. How do we stabilize uh, revenue sources? How do we identify new ones? Um, and then one thing we didn't talk about is the fact that um, many of you are self-help counties and sales tax revenues will also take a hit as long as we're in this recession. That will mean anywhere from 10, 20, 30% uh, reduction in revenue, sales tax revenues, which will have an impact on project delivery uh, down the line. So that's something we're gonna have to work through as well. We've been in touch with Self-Help Counties Coalition to uh, identify the issues and potential um, solutions going forward. Yes, that, that's great. And thank you, uh, Secretary Kim. I'll just be bold and ask, um, leave you with an assignment. Um, on behalf of the transit operators in the Bay Area, we would like to ask you to engage with your colleague, uh, Secretary uh, Tony Thurman. Uh, many of us provide the serv uh, supplemental service to schools. And as we get ready to welcome back students this fall, it's gonna be very important that we have better understanding of how they are, those students are gonna be supported with facial coverings and all of the requisite uh, protocols uh, in order to use public transportation. But thanks so very much. We appreciate you and uh, congratulations on your first year anniversary at CalSTA. Thank you so much, Nuria. It was uh, a lot of fun to be here. I uh, appreciate your leadership. And uh, just a plug for Nuria, in case you, you don't know, <laughs> Nuria was on a recent podcast. Um, this is a uh, podcast uh, done by Paul Comfort and uh, I think it may have been taped before the pandemic, but it was a great uh, way uh, for those of us to get to know your, your career background, uh, your personal background. It was really, really wonderful to hear you, Nuria. And so I would encourage everyone to, to check out the podcast, hear all about Nuria's life story and her career story. And uh, once again, thanks so much for having me and have a great conference. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. So our thanks to you. So now we're going to continue our conversation with a distinguished panel. Uh, with us today is Dr. Asha Weinstein Agrawal. She is the director of the Mineta Transportation Institute's National Transportation Finance Center, and she's also a professor in urban and regional planning at San Jose State University. Uh, Carl Guardino is uh, president and CEO of the Silicon Valley Leadership Group, a public policy trade association that represents nearly 350 of Silicon Valley's most respected employers. Additionally, uh, in 2019, Governor Gavin Newsom appointed Carl to his fourth consecutive term on the California Transportation Commission. And for those of you who do not know this, Carl is gonna be retiring uh, this year after 23 years at the helm at this, of the Silicon Valley Leadership Group. Uh, also, we have with us uh, Therese McMillan. Uh, she is the executive director of the Metropolitan Transportation Commission in San Francisco and the top executive for the Association of Bay Area Governments. In 2009, uh, she was appointed by President Barack Obama to serve as deputy administrator of the Federal Transit Administration, and she subsequently served as acting administrator of the FTA. And finally, uh, Matthew Tucker. Matt has served as the executive director and CEO of the San Diego area's North County Transit District since 2006. He previously served as director of the Virginia Department of Rail and Public Transportation and as the chief operating officer at my agency, the Santa Clara Valley Transportation Authority. So I'm going to start with a question for each of you and uh, for time purposes, we would like you to limit your response, if possible, to these uh, initial qu questions to three minutes. So I'm going to start with Dr. Asha Agrawal. So, Dr. Agrawal, based on your research, uh, what priorities does California public have for how to the, the state spends it its uh, transportation dollars? 
Thank you for that question, Nuria. Um, and I'd like to answer that by drawing on the results of some public opinion research that I've been doing actually for more than a decade, together with a colleague, Dr. Hillary Nixon. And I'll start with the findings from a survey of Californians that we did, 3,500 of our adults living in the state. And as part of that survey, we asked them to rank what um, the importance that they place on different goals for improving the transportation system. Um, first thing I should say is that the great majority thought that a wide variety of kinds of improvements were important. Um, and indeed, more than 90% valued these. And let me just give you some examples to, to give you some concrete um, numbers and, and topics. So 78% um, thought that it was very important, and I stress very important, to maintain our roads, streets, highways, and bridges. 75% thought that it was very important to reduce crashes and improve safety. Um, we had 63% who thought it was very important to reduce the health impacts caused by air pollution generated by cars and trucks. And we also had 52% who thought it was very important to make it more convenient to go places without driving, whether that's public transit or walking or bicycling. Um, so again, there's the key thing I think to stress is that you know a large majority of people um, view it very important to make improvements across different modes, um, and they're also thinking of different goals, um, whether that's reducing traffic congestion, improving safety, or cleaner environment. Now, if we do try and hone in on what the public sees as the top priority, the things that the largest number of people strongly support, it is maintenance. Um, nothing too glamorous, um, but just maintaining our local streets and roads, maintaining our highways. 94% um, of people thought it was important, um, either somewhat or very important, to be maintaining um, highways, and essentially the same number thought it was important to be maintaining local streets and roads. Now, another thing that's interesting is later we, in our survey, we asked people to prioritize sort of the top three ways the state could spend money. And we gave them a, a wide risk range of options. And here, maintenance came to the fore again, but there was a clear um, trend towards more people valuing maintenance of local streets and roads. So, for example, 45% of the people in our survey thought that it was very important to, one of their top three priorities was maintaining local streets and roads, um, which is somewhat higher than the 34% who thought that maintaining highways and, and freeways was a priority. So both are critical, um, but there's even a little bit more weight the public places on those, those local streets and roads. Another thing um, I want to do, though, is also turn to um, the results of, of more than 10 years of polling now that's looking at the United States broadly, so all adults, although Californians have followed the trends very closely. And here I want to stress that maintenance is not a new priority. Um, for more than 10 years, for 11 years now of polling, we have found that consistently the thing um, people want to see most is better maintenance. Um, and then again, the environmental improvements I mentioned are also something that over the years we have seen consistent support for making improvements to our transportation system to reduce air pollution, reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and then finally, I'll say also there has been, again, over 10 years, um, super majority support for public transit, and indeed for spending gas tax revenues on public transit. So let me stop there. Okay. Thank you very much, um, Asha. I, I now want to direct my question to Carl Guardino. So Carl, uh, for the coming decade, what role do you believe that the state of California should and will play in raising transportation revenues? And what will be the major changes uh, to current practice that you see? Well, whether we're talking about the state of California or whether we're talking about the innovation of Silicon Valley that permeates the Golden State, I think what we need to remember during such extraordinarily difficult times is a mantra that when the door is locked, we need to check the windows or build a new door. 
And when it comes to transportation funding at all levels of government throughout our communities and our country today, we should keep that in mind. So I'd like to mention a little bit about our current challenge and then our collective response. In terms of our current challenge, as a four-term, 14-year member of the California Transportation Commission, we are in many ways stronger than we've ever been been with the passage and implementation of Senate Bill 1, authored by Silicon Valley's Senator Jim Bell, that in the estimates would provide for 5.4 billion more in transportation funding each and every year. And by finally indexing the increases in our gas tax with inflation, not losing the strength of those funding sources over time. Well, when we think about both pre-Senate Bill 1 funding and Senate Bill 1 funding, the challenge we're facing in a COVID environment is rather than the average of 1.3 billion gallons of gasoline purchased to draw that funding source, we are now at 800 million gallons of gasoline purchased. That's a 500 million gallon decrease and a decrease commensurate in funding sources. And that totals pre-SB1 funds and SB1 funds, a loss of $1.85 billion in funding. That's real money when we're talking about the real needs of hardworking Californians who expect and deserve the improvements to our transportation systems throughout the Golden State. And Nuria Fernandez, as you know so well from the work you do in Santa Clara County through the Valley Transportation Authority and the work that Therese McMillan does so capably in a nine county region, so much of our funding, especially for capital improvements in transportation funding, are through countywide implementation of primarily sales tax measures. I've had the pleasure of successfully leading six of those county sales tax measures here in Santa Clara and helping in Santa Cruz counties over my 23 years as CEO of the Silicon Valley Leadership Group. Well, the buying power of sales taxes now is down. And that is also going to impact the funds. But since I'm seeing some long faces right now for folks who have dedicated their lives to transportation improvements, uh, let's talk about our collective response. First, at the state level, as you know, the road charge legislation that was passed in 2014 by our state legislature led to our road charge pilot program while uh, one of the years that I was chair of the California Transportation Commission that we had uh, in 2016 and 2017. 5,000 Californians participated, driving more than 37 million miles in that pilot program. And it demonstrated through different mechanisms uh, that 81% of Californians think that road charges should continue to be researched as we make the switch from fuel taxes as our primary funding source for uh, much of our transportation improvements throughout our country to a, a more mileage-based fee. And that's why California continues to work with the states of Oregon and Washington on road charge pilot programs so that we can make that switch. So here's what our Commonwealth Club uh, audience should picture. There's a scene in um, uh, with Harrison Ford uh, in Raiders of the Lost Ark, where he is trying to guess the weight of a golden statue with a bag of sand. And if he gets the weight right, he makes the switch. If he doesn't, poisonous arrows are going to be shooting at him. Well, that is what we're trying to do as over time, we thoughtfully make a switch from fuel-based funding for transportation improvements to a road charge-based system. Not to cost you and I as taxpayers and consumers more, but to guess the right weight of the bag of sand 
as we successfully make that switch over time to other ways to fund our transportation improvements. So yes, we have challenges today, but remember, as Winston Churchill said, when you find yourself in hell, keep going. Don't <laughs> stop there. We are in a pandemic. Pandemics have a start and they have an end. We are going through it and we'll go through it more successfully together as transportation leaders and as citizens of the United States when we remember we're going through this time. We're not stopping camping out permanently in this time and we are going to get through it. And as transportation professionals who know that we can be creative, we can come out stronger on the other side. Thank you very much, Carl. As always, you're very good with words and painting pictures, and we got it. <laughs> we certainly got it. <laughs> okay, so now I'm going to pivot over to um, Therese McMillan. You know, first, we need to understand, I think, how the pandemic impacted transportation and especially public transit in unprecedented ways compared to other crises. It's far flung instead of localized in terms of geography, contrasting to floods or fire or even a terrorist attack. It was swift and sudden, but it was the result of deliberate policy-generated decisions, like the imposition of shelter in place, compared to other economic downturns. The impact was and continues to be concentrated on operations not on infrastructure, at least for now, which is very different from how other crises have been. And there's no clear idea of when it's done. As Carl points out, there will be an end. But pinning down the recovery triggers continue to shift, particularly as we've unfortunately seen the surge back again with, with, a, uh, uh, with the virus. Um, so here's some perspectives on how those factors actually affect transportation revenues, but particularly, I think, how we're supposed to manage and use them. On the upside, we saw an infusion of emergency resources from the federal government, the CARES Act, uh, which is pretty typical in major disasters, the feds being able to step up for us. But the lack of boundaries to the pandemic makes the scale and effect effect of those emergency dollars really different. Because in the wake of a hurricane or a fire or some other natural disaster, there's a period of assessing the damage and scaling the emergency funding to address that damage. Now, it's not perfect, believe me, for any of us who've worked with FEMA and those, those circumstances in the past. But you at least kind of have a baseline, particularly when infrastructure is involved. But the damage in the face of the pandemic is, is a remarkable flip because what's been damaged is our operating environment. Um, you know, the questions now are how do you provide transportation as uh, public, you know, as transit providers um, to protect the public's health? We've not really had to look how, you know, through that lens before. Um, winning back traveler confidence. When is it going to be safe enough to come back to public transit? How do we frame that? Um, do you cut back travel, period? We're seeing this major upswing in telecommuting, which is proving to be um, not just, you know, a, a limited experience, but quite pervasive. Um, and is long distance travel outside of your private car ever going to be a good idea? I mean, I think that's one major question that's being asked. And our revenue sources are reacting directly to these public health uncertainties. As was pointed out earlier, transit fares, tolls, sales and use taxes, fuel taxes have all been, you know, um, reacting in, in, in very unstable ways. Um, an exception to that stability actually has been federal grants. That's been an interesting thing that we've seen. Um, we've seen the immediate revenue reductions. We're seeing some and expecting rebounds, I think, to varying degrees. But I'll stop here with the enduring lesson that I'm taking away from the pandemic, though, is that until 
the pandemic and the economy that's rebuilding around it really stabilizes. Revenues are going to be uncertain and the finan- and financial scenario planning is going to be essential. The last question in this segment uh, is going to go to Matt uh, Tucker, and it has to do with funding. So, Matt, when we all wished each other a happy new year <laughs> earlier this year, we never anticipated the disruption. We didn't, certainly did not anticipate a pandemic and one that has been with us for the past three months um, and will continue for a while. So looking at public transit and the sources that uh, support our industry today, what, what are your thoughts in terms of what needs to happen or what should happen uh, with funding for public transportation and what type of changes we need to anticipate or make happen uh, with uh, the current practice that we all rely on, on the sales tax and fuel tax? Thank you, Nuria. You know, um, I probably will start um, with, you know, kind of a look at transit before we got to 2000, before COVID-19. Um, I know for most uh, transit agencies, as we entered into the Great Recession period, um, we started experiencing a period of transit ridership growth. I know for a lot of transit agencies, our ridership peaked in 2015, and then ridership started to decline. Um, and you know, if you just look at that as a microcosm, I think we've spent a lot of time pre-COVID-19 trying to figure out, you know, what was the cause of transit ridership declines. And when we use the word transit ridership declines, that's also revenue decline because all transit agencies that rely upon transit revenue from customer riders to some degree. And I know for me and for my agency, we've spent an extensive amount of time taking a look at that survey that was done in Southern California understanding some of the shifts, some of the changes that have taken place in terms of the economy, that spatial mismatch that has widened between where people live and where jobs are located, while some people might have transitioned to their cars. And so we've been really focusing in on a perspective of how do we make our services more competitive? How do we know our market better? How can we grow ridership over time? And so we were really focused on this program that we call Zero Delay. It's a five-year initiative to really improve our services by asking ourselves some pretty hard questions that are going to carry through even this pandemic. Um, One of the things I give uh, people as an example is on our commuter rail system, we say 95% on top performance is our goal. And under our Zero Delay approach, when you look at that, 95% sounds great to get an A in a class, but that means one failure. Per month. And as I tell people, I don't know a whole lot of people who are in their car that says their car breaks down once a month and prevents them from getting to work on time or to a quality of life issue need. So going into this, we were already kind of at a pivotal point in the industry. We we're all looking at what can we do to get better. I know also for most of us, we also were looking at the tea leaves that we had been in a sustained period of economic growth. And typically within the U.S., for about every 10 years, we end up with, unfortunately, a recession. And having worked in the California in more than one stint, I know this can be boom or bust for California. So for my agency, we are soon coming into this fiscal year, fiscal year, the current fiscal year 20, um, that there was going to be a downturn economically. So we started putting aside funds and trying to throw away some money. But we never thought about COVID-19. So now we're going to move our discussion um, where I'm going to be directing questions specifically to panelists, but I'm going to encourage the rest of you, uh, if you want to add to the responses or if you want to expand on some of the points that uh, the panelist is making, just raise your hand and I'll call on you. Let me just put out the obvious when it comes to the federal government, because I'm going to ask you to, to share with us based on your experience having worked with the federal government and, of course, in your leadership role at the MTC, is what you believe that the federal government should be doing um, in their role in raising transportation revenues. So I'll just let me just take off the most obvious one off the table, uh, and that is indexing the gas tax to inflation, which has not happened at the national level, but we were successful in doing it here in California. So with that, Therese? A number of speakers, I think, have identified. um, uh, Secretary Kim, I think, uh, did a very good job in highlighting the fact that 
DC is firing up for reauthorization, and so we're expecting to see um, some specific policies coming out of that. I can comment on on some of the things you know we're looking for there. And Carl, I think, mentioned a really important continuing discussion at the federal level, which is will gas taxes at all remain the key source of what underwrites uh, revenues going to the, you know, the highway uh, trust fund. Um, and what does that look like in, in a, you know, scenario where, you know, new technologies are coming into effect and whatnot. So I think one thing the federal government does have to continue to do is look forward to how transportation itself is going to be changing. Um, the, you know, automated vehicles and all of those, and you brought this up, Nuria, constantly in terms of your leadership role at APTA, we need to be thinking ahead to how the industry is going to change because the revenue sources supporting that likely also have to change too. That said, <laughs> if we're looking at the next decade, uh, I think there's a, a few things that are going to remain the same, but maybe with a few twists. Um, you know, just because COVID is top of mind, I do believe that the federal government will continue to have an extremely important role in terms of emergency episodic funding. Um, I think that they, they have the scale to do that. And I think that's really important. When I was at the FTA, you know, one of the things we did was actually bring forward an, a, a federal trans emergency program. And I unfortunately, I think those types of safety nuts are going to continue to have to be in place. And that's important. And again, kudos to Congress for stepping forward so swiftly with CARES. Um, I expect the federal program to generally be consistent with some of the existing structures. And speaking to public transit in particular, um, I as currently, I don't expect that operating assistance for our large transit operators is going to be um, you know, underwritten by the federal government, although they they probably will continue to do have that for the smaller operators. I expect major capital investments to continue, but I would say coming out of this, that for the major expansions, I think there's going to be serious evaluations on assessing the ability of public transit agencies to recover and stabilize ridership, I think particularly in the next five to 10 years, because we don't know how swiftly we'll be able to come back and reset. I think when we're looking at capital expansions, there's going to be a much keener eye to that as, as part of that evaluation. Um, I hopefully we should see, I would hope to see an increase in the flexibility of formula funding. Um, you know, the, the bright lines that FTA had drawn between capital and operating, they softened to their credit in responding to the pandemic, allowing um, formula funds to be used more flexibly. I would hope a lesson learned out of that is that allowing states and localities greater flexibility to use dollars to the needs that they see at any particular point in time would be something that would be built into the federal program. I, I, I just think that that would be super important. Um, so, you know, I think, I'll, you know, stop there. I think there's a lot to be said in terms of continuing to advance the, the, the scale of the funding that's needed and where it comes from. I think, well, whether VMT driven, you know, uh, structures go forward, I think is a very important point. And what we do in an area of, um, you know, autonomous vehicles and what that might mean in terms of, of other creative sources of funding. But in terms of kind of the basic structures, you know, people are drawn to stability and what they know. So I think it will, certainly in the last 10 years, we'll see some of that stuff. So I, I believe we can now uh, move on to Asha. And Asha, we've been talking a lot about different sources of funds. And just to get those of us uh, that are participating in today's event uh, at the same level of understanding, could you walk us through uh, the transportation funding that comes from local and state and federal uh, and how those have changed here in California? Yes. So... Um, the first, 
thing I would say is that it is an incredible, it is either a confusing mess or a beautiful quilt, depending on your perspective, I suppose. Um, when we just think of California and transportation, the money is coming from dozens of places. Um, and it, so it's coming from all levels of government, but even at every level, there are many sources. So at the local government, it's, of course, sales tax revenues, as we've heard, but a lot of um, general fund revenue, which for our cities and counties comes from property taxes, from hotel taxes, from parking revenues, from all these different sources. Um, and then at the state, it has been sort of the centerpiece has been fuel taxes for 100 years. But um, we also have seen with SB1 increasing reliance on vehicle registration fees as a source of money to, to pay for our services and infrastructure. Um, and then the federal government, it's mostly fuel taxes, but there are also truck weight fees and different, different sources. So if we kind of look at the grand sweep, in California, the sort of key changes over the last few decades has been much, much more revenue coming directly from our local cities, counties, and transit agencies, and kind of a an overall slow decline in federal and state contributions comparatively. Um, although with the federal government, what we've seen in this sort of goes to what Therese has just seen is we've seen big increases episodically in response to national economic you know, recessions or, or disasters. And so the federal government really does come through with a lot of sort of temporary funding. Um, but kind of the big picture is the federal contribution has, has not been increasing. And that has a lot to do with the fact that the federal gas tax has not been raised since the 90s. Um, it's the same sense for gallon. And I, I would just take a moment and, and ask everyone to think if your salary hadn't gone up since the 1990s. Um, no cost of living increase or anything. It it would be hard to make ends meet. Um, but the bright bright story in all of this is that the locals have done just an amazing job, um, really across the state, although particularly in the bigger urban counties, um, kind of stepping up and filling those gaps. I want to turn now to uh, to Carl because uh, there have been some lessons and you uh, coming and representing the private sector. I'm just wondering if you could share with us uh, your perspective on uh, new lessons and opportunities as a result of COVID, where integrating private sector contributions to a transportation system, uh, whether it's the capital construction or the um, operations, you know, what, what is your take on that? Is that something that is here or is it something for the future? It's both now and in the future. And it's been our past. And we can build on a successful past of public and private sector and public and private citizens working together. So let me focus on two thoughts in answer to your, com your comment and question, Maria. One is creativity without cash. And I'll come back to that in a, more, a moment. And the second is shared responsibility. So creativity without cash. One of the silver linings of this global pandemic that we are all experiencing is that I can see blue skies in the Bay Area again. We have cleaner skies and clearer roadways through this challenging time. What have we learned and what can we do to continue to build on that during and post pandemic? And part of that is alternative work arrangements. I'm sure for everyone here today as executives leading teams, did we ever think how productive and successful our teams could be working remotely? That we can entrust to them the responsibility to still meet their goals while still meeting this challenge head on? And we can build on that. Now, let me be clear, there is not a panacea that every company, public or private, or every job within a company will work remotely in an effective way for everyone. And we all have circumstances where we live, even if the job could be done remotely, that it will be successful for every employee. So let's put those realities on the table. 
let's also put on the, re- the, the table the reality of my days at, at Hewlett Packard that we used to call water cooler talk that there is something magical about those chance interactions with our colleagues around the water cooler in the hallway that can lead to innovation and inspiration that we should never sell short. But the jobs that can be done remotely from home, at least some of the time, if we carry those forward post-pandemic, we are going to have less traffic and cleaner skies through those jobs that can be done at least some of the time remotely. My organization, the Silicon Valley Leadership Group, already had a liberal work from home policy of up to two days a week. That's going to become more liberal as we've seen how successful many of um, uh, many of our jobs can be done and all of our employees doing those jobs can be done remotely. So let's not lose the magic of this moment to build a movement towards more remote work when it can be done successfully for the employer and and the employee. That's creativity without cash. The second part, though, is shared responsibility. Therese will be able to correct me, and I hope she will if I'm wrong, but when we think of the employer shuttles in the Bay Area that many of our larger and mid-sized employers have invested in, Combined, they would be about the sixth or seventh largest bus transit system in Northern California. And those are happening without taxpayer funds. That is an investment by employers in the future of their employees and our communities. Because every time we see one of those buses, with 42 people on it, that's 41 fewer brake lights in front of me on the freeways in the Bay Area and better uh, uh, air pollution and lower greenhouse gas emissions. That's one way that employers have stepped forward, putting their wallets where their words are. Nuria, Matthew, Therese, we also know that when we do sales tax measures, as 25 of the 58 counties in California have done to be self-help counties, in our county, 43 cents of every dollar in sales tax collected is from employers themselves. We're putting our wallets where our words are as we move forward as companies and as communities and as individual citizens. That's going to need to continue to grow so that we can all meet this moment of how we fund transportation through the traditional public dollars as well as even enhanced private dollars. Yeah, and I just wanted to build on what what Carl said because it's something that, um, as Secretary Kim pointed out, we're all working together with this Blue Ribbon Task Force uh, to, um, you know, address the potential for growth and and innovation and reimagining of transportation. I think the term of really thinking about public mobility as opposed to public transportation in the traditional way we thought about it, it's really going to be the driver that we need to really think about what is the, whether it's private sector, public sector, um, you know, through, uh, through our, you know, even neighborhoods and communities and what they can do on their own. How are we providing the options that are needed for all members and importantly, again, all members of our community to be able to get to where they are as safely, cleanly and efficiently as possible? And as we think about that, the, you know, the traditional getting out of our silos, when we think about a public mobility that that's rich and has layered options, our funding structures are going to have to respond in a similar way to be as flexible and malleable to what that looks like. And that's not something, our, as Asha pointed out, that's not something our structures do very well. We, you know, we have things that are modal. We have things that are operating or capital. You know, they tend to be very rigid, and we're going to have to think through collectively how to change that if we're going to think about a future that's also far more flexible and option-driven. 
Um, very well said, Therese, because that's a perfect connection to the next question, which is for you. And that is, uh, what are your thoughts on whether the state of California should give regional governments greater ability to impose tax and fees for, to fund transportation? You know, that's a, it is, that is an interesting question, um, because in many ways we're seeing it not just in transportation, but also in housing and a number of other issues that are that I think that the problems themselves are not bound within local boundaries, that just the nature of the need extends beyond political lines on a map that we've often drawn for ourselves. You know, the Bay Area has periodically sought the capacity to impose um, or pursue with the voters largely um, regional level authority in, in terms of fees, the bridge toll increases, you know, meet regional measure one, two, and three. Um, housing, um, AB uh, 1487 just passed this legislative session, which allows a Bay Area Housing Finance Authority um, to pursue, again, um, uh, voter initiatives to underwrite affordable housing. I mean, that's groundbreaking. Um, uh, Carl and uh, and others were leading very recently uh, the FASTER initiative, which was seeking a regional sales tax um, authority. And so I think this region in particular has been successful in establishing the need for a regional fee or tax or other mechanism. Um, again, because I think we've been able to persuade the public, often very skeptical, mind you, that these problems are larger and there needs to be a larger collective approach, including funding to wrap around it. Um, so the question of whether the state should provide this increased capacity for us to do it on our own without every single time going to the legislature to have a bill passed to allow us to do this. <laughs> Um, you know, we could make the case that the accountability ultimately rests with the voters, that if we have the authority to the degree we're still bringing it forward, we need to make our case. We need to establish um, the parameters of we are going to use this new funding responsibly, with transparency and um, with an eye toward the public good. And that if we don't make that well, it won't pass as a ballot box. All that said, local control versus regionalism is a long-standing tension. It's just part of the political fabric, particularly in California. And, you know, I think it will factor into any discussions in Sacramento about, you know, fundamentally changing the, these authorities I'm hopeful that we can continue to focus on solving the problem instead of protecting our traditional roles. But again, that's, that's always something that our democratic system will <laughs> build space to pursue. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Therese. Uh, we could not um, finish this conversation without touching on equity. Uh, Secretary Kim brought up equity uh, in different contexts, uh, given some of the unfortunate situations that the country has experienced. But then it also falls uh, uh, as well in public transportation because we are the greatest equalizer. We serve all. So um, I'm going to ask uh, Asha, uh, what role should equity concerns play on our, on our government leaders as they're considering different tax and fee options. And are some of these taxes or fees inherently more fair to others, to some a, than others? Yeah, that's a really important question. Um, I mean, on the face of it, I think the simplest thing that comes to most people's minds is that if you are low income, it's harder to pay any tax or fee. Um, and especially those that are are like a sales tax. You know, if I buy a loaf of bread, I'm paying the same amount as someone 20 times richer than me or somebody who can, can barely afford food. Um, however, I think sometimes we, we get stuck there and on any particular tax, we sort of think, oh, it's inequitable. And, and in some sense it is, but I think the more useful way um, to proceed, and I don't know if this fits with the analogy of going out the window rather than the 
sort of getting stuck at the locked door, is to think, well, okay, we have a range of options. Which of these, from an equity perspective, would be better and which less good? Um, and so the gas tax, I think actually, um, and someday that may be a mileage fee instead, has the beauty that from an equity per standpoint, at least the people using the service directly are the ones who are paying. Um, and that's different from the sales taxes, which have many wonderful qualities, aside from just the fact that we've been able to pass them. And um, But a sales tax, you know, if I never drive, I'm still paying the same sales tax on that loaf of bread as somebody who is maybe driving 20,000 miles a year. Um, and so I think that if we can continue to think about user fees to the extent possible, that adds a certain level of equity. And then the other thing, though, I will say is to try to think about, and this is not something in the U.S. we do nearly as much as a lot of European countries, for example, which is to charge different rates to people with different abilities to pay. And that's usually not finely graded. But for example, um, if you are very low income in some countries, you get either free or, or much cheaper transit. Um, you know, fares, which we've started to see in the U.S., um, and MTC has led an important initiative on that, but it's it's far from universal. But even for things like if we were to move towards more tolling um, or even a mileage fee that's billed to a person, we could have the equivalent of a utility lifeline rate for very low-income people. So they still pay, but they pay more according to their abilities. So I, I, and I think the public is becoming more and more sort of aware of these equity considerations. And I, I do think they're critical to our discussions. Carl? I'm sorry, these are such important questions and it's a shame that we have so little time. So far, the only tax that we have found people like are the taxes that other people pay rather than themselves. And that is a challenging balance to strike. Uh, we have heard, um, even on the gas tax, that many of our lowest income uh, residents have to travel further from their residences to their jobs, often if they have a car, in a car that gets uh, much worse miles per gallon, and so that can be inequitable. Um, we heard similar concerns about those paying bridge tolls and the length of trips they take and how many bridges that, um, that poor people often have to cross. We hear the same with sales tax. Sometimes we forget with sales tax that sales taxes aren't applied to at least three of the four biggest expenses in most households, your residence, your health care, and um, forgive me, um, I, this is where food? any of you can step in and uh, and food. Thank you. Your groceries. Um, so when you you threw me off, Asha, when you said bread, because bread <laughs> isn't subject to the sales tax. Uh, so at least three of the biz, biggest expenses aren't taxed. And so these are all conversations we need to be having even more so. But the lens that I think Therese and MTC are looking at, that we were looking at through FASTER, have some common grounds relative to equity. First, what are the transportation improvements and systems that you are building and operating, and how do those help people who are in uh, lower income communities? Are you building the systems that uh, are most needed? That's one. Two, are you looking at, uh, at uh, fares that accommodate people of different means to pay? That's two. Those were two critical elements of what we were looking for in FASTER. And then three, the mechanism itself and how you try to make that as equitable as possible. This is such a great conversation, and I know we could go on and on and on, uh, but um, we are at the point where we need to wrap up uh, today's panel. So I want to take this opportunity to, to thank each of the panelists. 
uh, Asha Weinstein Agrawal, the director of the Mineta Transportation Institute's National Transportation Finance Center, Carl Guardino, the president and CEO of the Silicon Valley Leadership Group, uh, Therese McMillan, executive director of the Metropolitan Transportation Commission in San Francisco, and Matt Tucker, who's joined us from Southern California, and he's the executive director and chief executive officer of the North County Transit District. So thank also to today's keynote speaker, uh, David Kim, Secretary of the California State Transportation Agency. And many thanks to Dr. Dr. Karen Philbrick, Executive Director of the Mineta Institute, for her earlier participation. And I want to join my voice in thanking our founder, uh, the Honorable Norman Mineta, for joining us today as a participant. Uh, so with that, I wish all of you a safe and healthy rest of the week. So thanks again and goodbye.